Welcome to the Inside UK webinar. This webinar is brought to you exclusively by the Chopras, one of India's largest and most successful global education companies. Our Inside UK webinar today will cover a number of key areas. Why choose the UK? Criteria for choosing a university in the UK? the types of universities in the UK, emerging sectors and skill shortages, average graduate incomes, tuition and other living costs, as well as some issues surrounding the types of visas available after the studies. Our keynote speaker this afternoon is Mrs. Natasha Chopra, Managing Director of the Chopras. Mrs. Chopra has spent much of her life in the UK Having been educated in two of the UK's leading institutions, Mrs. Chopra has also spent a considerable amount of time working in a variety of leading organizations across the world. After returning to India in 1995, Mrs. Chopra established the Chopras, one of India's largest and most successful global education companies, and has spent the last 20 years shaping the lives and careers of students seeking global education opportunities. The structure of the webinar today will be in the format of a presentation. Questions will be taken throughout the webinar, so please do take the opportunity to post these via the chat facility as we go along. We will attempt to answer as many of the questions that come in as possible, but guarantee that any unanswered questions today will get a response by email in the coming few days. We hope that you enjoy today's webinar. And I will now hand over to Mrs. Chopra to officially begin today's event. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to all our speakers. Uh, we're going to be uh, spending the next 45 minutes um, just getting some insights about UK. Um, I think it can be very confusing these days uh, with the host of choices that there are where does one go? Well, I just wanted to share some personal experiences with you as well. Um, I was at the NAFSA Education Conference uh, in San Diego in May. Now, NAFSA is one of the largest uh, conferences worldwide. And what I found was that student mobility is obviously a huge area, but everybody is, is you know, all the, all the research and everything that there is, really shows, and there is enough data on this, that students who go overseas, even though it's for short periods, benefit a great deal in terms of their ability to link up with other nationalities, ability to learn about other countries, ability to mix up, and you know, the, uh, understand a new kind of system, and of course, the uh, education system in each country um, and all this inspires a great deal of confidence. So while UK is, has, has been one of the uh, traditional, uh, traditional seven English-speaking countries where students were going, um, it, was, it, was always the, uh, you know, it was always doing very, very well and, with, and, and as a second choice. Now you'd think that with all the platter of choices, what's happened? With all the platter of choices, um, when you've got so many emerging countries coming up, why are people still going to UK? Well, it should be no surprise to many of you, actually even despite the fact that there are so many other countries that have come up um, over the last uh, 10 years, UK is still the second most popular destination. And why is that? Well. As you would know, it has some of the oldest and the most reputed, you know, reputed universities in the world. Um, and oldest, we're going back to 1167 when Oxford was, Oxford was founded. Uh, Cambridge was founded in the uh, 13th century. You've got, in fact, seven ancient universities. And then the traditional universities came up. And a lot of these were in the uh, 18th and 19th century. So there's a, there's a huge amount of tradition. Um, that is carried on in university education. It's not a new institution that has just come up and started teaching. So the 
so historically, uh, Britain has always been known for its excellence, and excellence in research, excellence in teaching, uh, excellence in the quality of the infrastructure that it uh, it uh, it has, the excellence in uh, in the kind of facilities that there are for students. Many of these universities are, are in beautiful campuses, and of course you get uh, you get students from across the world. Britain is one of those countries that has more than a hundred nationalities, and perhaps even more at times that you can that you can mix with. Um, and throughout the world. Uh, the U.S. obviously has uh, has many reputed universities, but in terms of tradition, um, U.K. is 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 the place to go to if that's what you're looking for. Um, it's always been recognised for its world class class education, and a lot of groundbreaking research, in fact, has been done in U.K. and sometimes marketed by other countries. Um, a lot of you would have heard about. Uh, you know the cloning of Dolly the sheep that was actually done uh, in in UK. A lot of the DNA research has also been done in UK, and talking about the older times, penicillin and so on. So there's a lot of research, and that's because the kind of uh, education system that they have is a very independent, study-based system where you are supposed to spend a lot of time on your own doing research and have time to think rather than the root system of moving from classroom to classroom, book to book. They do give you a lot of, lot of free time. So we have the high quality that we're talking about. Um, and of course, this leads to high quality students, leads to employability. And Employability is not just about employability in UK. Um, I mean, the thing that I mean, we've been uh, the Chopras have been established since 1995, and we have, you know, seen over the years how our students go to UK, for example, and that is then used as a platform to go to other countries, and they and they are able to do that because uh, universities and employers across the world recognize the high quality of education that the student must have received. Now, this is not only in terms of how the person can speak, but in terms of the skills that they've acquired, in terms of the communication levels, in terms of uh, the confidence that they, that they have. So all these things lead our students to be globally employable from one place to another. Um, of course, you know, the, world's, the uh, world famous alumni and there are so many of them that you know, uh, you know, Dr. Um, sorry, Mahatma Gandhi um, was a was alumni. A lot of uh, a few of our uh, prime ministers, of course, have been there, and other and you know, the UK also, in fact, has given more than 107 uh, Nobel Prize winners, uh, and not just in sciences, but across a variety of subjects, whether it's economics. In fact, we have uh, a number of economists who are also Indian, um, who have been to UK universities. And of course, value for money. Uh, because of the shorter duration, uh, the UK, in fact, tends up, ends up being quite economical compared to some of the other countries. Um, and, you know, and then you wonder, well, why shorter programs? Um, the UK has one year program for masters, whereas other countries would have one and a half year or two years. And the reason they're able to do that is because the intensity of the program is that uh, a master's degree will be about 48 weeks rather than 30 weeks in many other countries. So the breaks are not there. So it's very, very intense. And the same goes for uh, the undergraduate programs as well, which are far more intense. In fact, many students finish the uh, undergraduate program in three years as opposed to the four years. And in four years in the UK, you can, for example, uh, have the MEng, which is still an undergraduate program, as opposed to a BEng in uh, other countries, um, so, which will be four years. So there's a huge advantage, and I think each student needs to look at this. And even our students who've done uh, undergraduate degrees here, a lot of them use the UK as a one-year, the one-year program as a platform, and then to be able to go to the USA, for example, or other countries that are looking for the 16 years um, of education. 
Well, the other thing I do want to mention is that, I mean, UK universities have now come up with a lot of branch campuses um, across the world. So therefore, it's not that you have to go to a UK university only in UK. You can go to Malaysia, you can go to Thailand, you can go to Singapore. And there are many institutions who recognize the quality of the UK degrees and therefore have a lot of collaborative programs. A lot of Singapore institutions will have collaborations with UK universities. And there are, you know, a very large number of, uh, of these centers and these are centers of excellence. Well, um, so we've come, we've decided that the UK is the right destination because of the quality of its education, high rankings, and uh, re really well-known, uh, uh, a well, a well-renowned reputation worldwide. How do you pick a university? So that's that's the next criteria. Well, first of all, I think it's we need to decide about your career aspirations and what you really want to do. And this is very important that you look at the career aspirations and, of course, the outcome that you are looking for. Laws change across the world, immigration laws, uh, student visa laws, all these change subject to uh, what the needs of the country are, what the economics needs are, and the econ economics needs leads to the political decisions that are made. And I think these are things that you need to research very, very carefully. Um, you know, we talked about this in my previous webinars as well, that if a country is far easier on accepting people to come in and being able to stay, that's simply because they have the need for migrant populations to come in and recognize the skill shortages that there are and will be far more open. Um, many people think that the UK is restrictive. Well, it's partly restrictive, but not necessarily so, and I think a lot of it depends on what it is that you're looking for. But we'll come, ba we'll come back to that. So let's say that the UK does choose your aspirations and outcome. Um, really speaking, you need to pick up a few of the universities that suit your academic profile, the budget, and... Um, but really speaking, this can be quite tough, um, and this is where the Chopra's counselors come in very useful, as they're the ones who understand the requirements of each institution and are able to understand you, and their job is to match the, match the two profiles so that they fit to get, give you the perfect outcome. Now, rankings are another criteria, but remember, rankings should not ever be the only criteria. A university may be high in ranking, as in general, but is it, is it a good ranking for the subject that you want to learn? Um, is it a good ranking for what you want to study and, and be well known for? So we have to have a combination of both of these uh, factors. Um, and there can be some universe, and also then of course the teaching quality is very, very important. There are some universities that will only bring in research students to teach you. Other universities will focus a great deal more on the teaching quality. Um, so while research students are good because they, they're up to date in the latest research, um, are they the quality that you want to be taught by? All these questions are answered um, by us and help you to decide on the, on the universities. Um, what are the prospects after the course completion? Um, you know, what we would also advise you on are programs which have internships, programs which have placements, um, programs which will offer you something extra than what you would traditionally look for. And there are a huge number of other factors. You may have some family support there, for example, uh, which is very important. Um, so all these things help you in, uh, you know, I mean, the cost of living. London typically is more expensive than being in a, in a, in a smaller city. Um, and the duration of the programs. Um, while masters are one year, there are some masters which are also nine months. Uh, and, the, and the kind of program that it is, are these people with work experience or not with work experience? How many seats are there in that particular course? How tough is it to get into? So tough questions, and we have the answers to those tough questions. Questions, where are the questions? 
Well, th there are approximately 165 universities in the UK. Now that's a, a fair large number and uh, the choice can be quite daunting. How, how do you choose the university? Well, there are, I mean, let, let's break it down into the categories which you can now see on the, uh, on the screen. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there are about seven uh, sorry, ancient universities, um, but there are also a lot of universities that came up in the uh, 19th and 20th centuries. A lot of these came up after the uh, Industrial Revolution, uh, when there was a need for, uh, you know, educating the workforce as uh, industries were coming up. There were also the, uh, the, the other factor about the missionaries and focusing on Christian education. Um, and there were a lot of uh, colleges that were set up for programs in skill bases, uh, which would then became you know, universities. So we have that first category. Then we have what's called the plate glass universities. And a lot of these came up in the 60s. And as you can see, there's about 11, 11 of them there. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just going to count them. Three, six, nine, ten of them. And a lot of, in fact, more of them. Um, in fact, these universities were there to cater for the, uh, the baby boom. And also, there was a Robbins report which clearly listed, that, uh, which clearly showed that there was going to be huge demand for education. Um, remember in the old days, maybe you didn't have more than 2% of the population going to university. It was very, very elitist. And as these universities uh, came up, there was a larger section of the population going to, to study there. Then you have the new universities. Now, let, let's not, let not the name deceive you. Because while they were given the university status only in 1992, many of these, in fact, have their foundation back in the 1850s or, uh, or, or later. And these were basically colleges of education or what we would call the polytechnics. Now, the polytechnics are typically, have typically been very, very strong in their teaching, whereas the universities have been very strong in their research. Um, but that distinction, while it's still there, is now merging into the two because a lot of the new universities, in fact, are also uh, focusing on research to raise their rankings. Because in the UK, the rankings are typically uh, based on the kind of research that's done by an institution of both which is of national and international importance. Let me take some questions. Well, I have some uh, quest questions here um, that it's saying that, you know, uh, are, there, are there any scholarships available? Well, the UK does have scholarships um, and, and they are available. Uh, a lot of them are, are the, uh, the, the, the public scholarships like the DFID, the, the Charles Wallace, the British, uh, the Chimney Scholarships and so on, Rhodes Scholarship. Um, at the same time, I mean, these are very, very competitive and you have to be, you know, you have to be, you have to apply well in advance and you have to be prepared to spend your time uh, uh, in writing up the essays and so on. There is also the scholarships done by, uh, offered by universities, which can be by department or by the international office. Uh, both need to be looked at. And by the way, uh, if you get a good uh, score in IELTS, there's also a three lakh scholarship available by the British, uh, by IELTS and British Council. Now, intakes and entry requirements. So the the, the key thing is that um, the, the the key intake is in September. However, uh, there are other intakes as well. A lot of these are in January, but these are typically smaller intakes. But these, a lot of these tend to be for the, uh, what we call the new universities. They have a larger section of them and a, and a very select number of the uh, traditional universities maybe have a, a few subjects on offer. Um, now, we're also, going, we're also looking here at the entry requirements. Now, please don't be deceived by the percentages. We put them down to show you that you can get in uh, even though you have 
lower marks, but it doesn't mean that you can go to the best universities because like everywhere else in the world, uh, if you're looking at the top end universities, just as Delhi University, you're going to look for very high marks. The reason we put those marks down is because what the option that the UK does offer you are pathway programs. So pathway programs means that you can go there for a year, study foundation, or maybe even a diploma. So maybe, so let's say for example you're 55%, you can go into a foundation program for a year or so, and then this is your opportunity to pull up your grades by being serious and really studying. Um, and then once you've pulled up your grades, then you get an option of institutions that you can, that you can go to. Um, there's also the option of a diploma program, which means that you study one year program and it's very intense. Uh, it's, like the, it's, it's like the first year of university, but in separate classes because you're given a lot more attention. And then if you do well, you can then go on to the second year of university. And by the way, uh, you can also do this diploma uh, which, uh, which the Chopras are offering in their institute, the TCIP, uh, which is an NCUK product uh, recognized by 11 British universities, and it's their curriculum uh, starting in January, where you can study the first eight months here, uh, sorry, seven months, and then move on to the second year of some select British universities. Now, PG, again, as we've said, 50%. But clearly, uh, you can't go to the high-ranking universities there. But if it's a program that's suitable for, for you, um, come and talk to us, and we can advise you which, which programs you can, you can do. IELTS and PT, well, most universities, a lot of universities sometimes may waive the IELTS. But our advice always is not to... Uh, not to uh, not to not sit it. You really should sit the IELTS because the language uh, for yourself is important even though you may have a reasonably good score. Prove it to yourself and it always makes it easier for the uh, High Commission to assess your English competency. Now while the GMAT is, a, is an American uh, test, there are some programs that require the GMAT. Uh, and this is particularly for the MBA, um, and it may be for some finance programs, but a very few select number of universities will ask you for the GMAT. So again, you will need to see the university's uh, requirement. And then, of course, the work experience. If you want to do an MBA, well, remember, the MBA is really for uh, students who have work experience. We have listed two years, but for, again, uh, the high-ranking universities, you may need anything from three to five years at least. And there are some fresher MBAs available as well. And our advice is to look at the fresher MBAs, but also weigh them up against the uh, uh, MSc programs. I think let's take a, a, a few quick. No, let me cover this uh, tuition and other living costs, and then we'll cover the questions. Right. Um, okay. Just one moment. Let's discover the tuition and other living costs. Um, the tuition fees generally will vary between, uh, say, eleven and a half to fifteen thousand pounds a year. Um, in fact, even higher at times. Uh, the 11,400 will be for the uh, uh, business programs and uh, social sciences, whereas the 15,000 pounds on the higher side will be for the sciences and engineering. Um, Postgraduate programs, again, very, very similar. The higher cost will be for uh, engineering programs and the lower cost for the social sciences and management. The MBAs are an exception, which can vary considerably depending on whether the they are with work experience or not. Again, you will need to contact one of our counselors to get more detail. You can also, of course, do the doctoral degrees, um, and these are reasonably uh, priced at around the 13,000 marks, but again, vary from university to university. Um, the uh, UKVI have given a very set criteria for the living expenses, and they, they they have listed 10,000 pounds, um, sorry, 1,000 pounds a month 
for London and 800 pounds for uh, if you're out of London. Um, so basically you're looking at about 12,000 pounds for uh, London and about, uh, depending on the whether you're doing an undergrad or postgrad programs at 800 pounds a month. Um, and the minimum really is about 7,000 pounds a year uh, and the rest of UK is 5,000. That, that's for the accommodation, I'm sorry. For the accommodation, it's at least 7,000 pounds, although our experience says that in fact it can be even more than that. Let's, uh, let's take a few questions. Um, what is, I have a question here by Pranthik. What is the extent of getting a scholarship? Uh, I'm sorry, it's already been, it's already been uh, answered. Let me go on to uh, an, another question. Um, could you give us some information specifically about law and the criteria of selection of candidate? Well, law, law graduates can come from different backgrounds, but the most preferred backgrounds are humanities. And one of the things that you need to be very, very strong in, of course, is your English. So if you, you need to have a, a, an IELTS score of a minimum of uh, seven. And Preeti, I'm not sure whether you have, um, whether you're asking about undergraduate or postgraduate. But for undergraduate, yes, you can come from various backgrounds. And for postgraduates, most law programs will require you to have a law, law degree. Um, there are a there are, there are very few exceptions to this, and again, we can, we can talk, about, talk about these uh, when you come and see us. Um, I've got a question here on part-time uh, work experience, sorry, on part-time work and what can my spouse do if she comes along? Um, well, uh, spouses are allowed to work full-time, so while you're studying part-time, they are allowed to work part-time. But this is not for anyone who's doing the, uh, the foundation program or the diploma program. It has to be for the undergraduate and postgraduate programs. And of course, the institution has to be a university and not a college. Now, there's a question here about, um, you know, can you suggest me the minimum requirements uh, for the MBA, should I be doing uh, an MBA early on or should I be doing it with work experience? Um, as if this really depends on your situation, it depends on the kind of background you come from. Is it that you have a family business and your father would like to come back very quickly and join the family business? If that's the case, by all means, go and do a Freshers MBA. If, however, you are looking to gain work experience, uh, do an MBA and then go for a and then go for a, for a profession. Then that's probably the the better way to go. So it really depends on your on your situation. And this is this is very generic uh, advice that I'm able to give you. Now, you know the big question uh, is about, of course, the uh, the issue of. Uh, career job prospects. Well, let's not look at job prospects. Let's look at the broader aspect, which, is, which we would call as career prospects. Um, the UK is, a, is an advanced economy. There are some areas that, it's, that, it's, that are not moving very well. But in terms of innovation, in terms of infrastructure, um, you know, there is continuous development going on. So we've listed some of the emerging sectors. Uh, aerospace, for example, agricultural technology, automotive, construction, uh, information economy, nuclear, wind, uh, power, oil and gas uh, energy. In fact, anything to do with clean energy and efficient energy are, are all, all very strong emerging sectors. Um, in, in fact, even consultancy and, of course, international education. So. While we have a separate section for the skill shortages, what this also means is that students who are studying these areas, there are skill shortages because uh, these are new sectors and there is going to be continuing demand for, these, for, for students from these areas. Now, in the skill shortages, engineers are in demand the world over. Uh, it doesn't matter what engineering you've done, some, some areas are in more demand. Uh, that, you know, we were talking about this uh, in, in my earlier webinars, civil engineering is in far more demand in countries like Canada, for example, or, or in Australia. Uh, and in the UK, 
uh, mechanical engineering, electrical, electronic, design and development are, are in demand. Um, you also need to understand, you know, you should also be able to read up about the economy uh, of the country to see what, what is happening. Um, a lot of this, uh, a lot of this, um, uh, the shortages are because of the, the profile of the, the aging population. Now, there is, an, there is an aging population, so there is going to be huge demand, for example, nursing and uh, medical practitioners. Um, and, but, the, but you have to be very, very select as to which ones are in demand. Um, I just wanted to give you some, some data on this, that we have reports which indicate that a total of $2 billion have been invested into aerospace alone, and this is what's expected to be invested over the next six years, along with several hundred millions and billions of pounds pumped into the other sectors. So if you are, if those are sectors you're interested in, please do have a, have a look at them. There's also a lot of demand for, the, for teachers, for example, especially those who can teach uh, maths and sciences. And graduates can go from here, go into the PGC program, and be able, and then, then they get certification, validity, and then are able to teach. Uh, there are some uh, opportunities in the uh, creative areas as well. Um, the, for example, in animation, uh, graphic design. Uh, in fact, even in the uh, in in the uh, in areas like dance and choreography. Um, and then, of course, the analysts, architects, and systems designers. So there are, while it is tough to get a job, it's not impossible. And one of the things that you do need to bear in mind is that why should an overseas employer employ you as an international student? And this is a, a very, very important question, and you need to understand some of the answers to this, which is that you need to build up your profile Profile in a way while you're studying to build up your communication, to build up your language skills and other soft skills. Are you, for example, very good with Excel? Are you very good with uh, your PPTs? Do you have uh, a strong uh, hold on how to do Word documentations and can do macros? So students who are able to build up these skills, why not learn a language? Uh, you know, whether it's French or German or Spanish. Spanish, of course, as you know, is the uh, most spoken European language in the world, not just in Europe, but also in the Americas and South America. So these are all things that you can do to pick up on your, uh, on your, on your, on your own development and profile so that you are, you are attractive to a potential employer who sees you not just with a degree, but other aspects of your personality. One of the things that I believe that well, I would encourage all of you to do is to, um, there's, a, there's an organization called ISEC, which is a, an international community-based service programs where you can travel to uh, Africa, you can travel to Southeast Asia, you can travel to South America and do short-term programs during the holidays of whether it's three weeks or up to six weeks to help you with other aspects of uh, development, and there you can teach people, you can teach other people, help with building a hospital, all these things add to your profile. There's also another company called Winspire, which helps you to do uh, community programs. There are so many organizations, volunteer organizations. Now, these people won't pay you, you'll have to pay them uh, as, as an admin fee, you have to pay your fare, but they will help you with accommodation. Now, Winspire also is about community-based service, like we talk about NGOs. Go and help out with an NGO. It will only add to your own personality, your own breadth of thinking, and your profile. And that's what you'd want to build up. Now, coming back to the, uh, uh, um, the jobs scenario, there are obviously, you know, we've listed some of the areas. and. One of the, which we'll be covering as well shortly, that you, if you want to be able to stay in the UK, you need to find yourself a job, and that needs to earn you more than £20,300. Now, we've looked at some of the graduate uh, job sectors that, are, that have skills shortages or are emerging sectors. And as you can see, uh, investment banking is one of the highest. Uh, law is also very good at £38,000. 
oil and energy, remember you may be spending some time out in the North Sea in the oil rigs uh, of 32,000 pounds. Uh, engineering and industrial engineering, so this engineering covers the wide variety of engineering uh, areas, uh, 26,500 pounds. Now while it seems that the salaries are a little on the lower side, the, there are a lot of engineering jobs available. IT and communications, dentistry, consulting, media, retail, chemical and pharmaceutical, medicine. So if you're specializing in any of these areas, I don't think you should have too much of trouble finding a job. Okay, we have a, a, a question here. Um, I want to go for hotel management mainly in the culinary section. Uh, Apurva, there are uh, there are some good programs in uh, in in hotel management, and you can specialize in culinary arts as well. And what we do find is that the students who go for HM and culinary have generally get internships and are generally absorbed by hotels, not just, not necessarily in that country, but other parts of the world as well. Uh, there's a question here about, is there any scope for extracurricular activities while we are doing our postgraduate studies? Rishav, absolutely, and that is what you should be doing. University life is the one time in your life when you're with so many young people under one roof. And the universities provide a huge range of activities, um, and this can vary from playing squash, to uh, fell walking, you know, I, I was uh, at Lancaster, I used to go fell walking in the Lake District. Uh, you can go horse riding, you can go, I mean, do any, I mean, there's such a, a, a range. But I think you should also spend some time on the activities I've just spoken about, uh, joining ISEC, traveling, uh, other community programs, there's a huge amount to do. And anyone who's thinking of university, don't think generally only of academics because university life is not just about academics. We're talking about the experience which leads to a better person, a better wholesome profile of you and something that is, and somebody that is far more confident. Um, I have a question here. Does a good SAT score boost your chances? What are the best schools, B schools in the UK? Sanjay, the SAT scores are not for, for UK. Uh, UK universities don't generally require them. Most will require your year 12 results. And other universities, like some of the London universities, uh, actually will only look at your IB results or your A-level results. Well, so you've studied in the UK and you want to extend your visa. How do we do that? The one thing that all of you should do and well in advance is to plan and prepare. It doesn't mean that your course is coming to an end and suddenly you become conscious, oh my god, my visa is expiring, let me try for a visa extension. It's not going to work. What you're going to have to do is to plan this well in advance. Now there are three options that we've given you here, which is the tier 2, tier 4 and tier 1. So let's talk about each one of them. From 6th of April 2012, um, the, anybody who has studied a bachelor's degree or a master's degree, PhD, PGC as well, or a PGDE, can apply for Tier 2. Now, what does Tier 2 mean? Tier 2 means that you have to be, you have to be able to get a job. Currently, there are about, if you look at the UKVI website, there are about 28,000 employers who have registered themselves and who are willing to employ students. So if you want to employ, if you want to get employment, in fact, the, you have to be prepared because the employment deadlines, sorry, application deadlines for employment are anything up to a year ahead. So students who want jobs in September 2015 would have had to apply by 2014. Um, and there are very set deadlines. For example, they will you, you put the application deadlines by the deadline, uh, say by October, some are in November. They will then call you for interviews by January, February. They will make you the offers by March, April, May. And then if you are fortunate enough to have the, uh, the offer, you will then be able to join in September. So it's not that suddenly you wake up 
um, next year and say, okay, oh my God, my uh, course is uh, going to be over in June, what do I do? The planning should have been done already this year, and if you haven't done it up to now, there may be still some deadlines that are open. I suggest you start to apply now for students who are already overseas. Um, the other thing I would like each one to do is to prepare your CV well in advance. Now, for the students who are going to go next September, please prepare your resumes beforehand and identify the employers that you want to be targeting. Go to the Tier 2 website, have a look, and start writing. Because by the time you get there, you're going to be so busy and so absorbed, absorbed with your university life, you won't have much time. The other option that's available to you is the, the Tier 4, which is a doctorate extension program. The UK is looking for very highly qualified, skilled individuals, which is why they're only opening up, opening up the extensions to, to, to these uh, kind of individuals. So the doctorates, again, you will need to apply a year in advance to be able to get a job. You can also, you can, however, get a year's extension, and that year will give you the possibility of working or the time to find a job, but you should actually be trying earlier. So doctorates can apply. The other one that's interesting, uh, which again shows that the UK is giving options, but you have to be smarter than uh, you know, the other Joe blog sitting next to you, um, and that is the graduate entrepreneur route. A lot of universities um, have a graduate entrepreneur program, and they can have anything from five to 20 students that they can sponsor. What this entails is that you have to come up with a brilliant idea um, of uh, of some uh, some business plan that you would some business idea that you have, and with this business idea you make a business plan that is then submitted to the university. It is deliberated, um, and if the if the if the panel agrees, you are then given a year's extension after your studies. And in that year, this gives you time to. Uh, implement your business plan or find funding for it and, and so on. So this is another route that you can have. Um, in fact, I was talking to, uh, to a university who were here recently um, and a lot of these universities have incubation uh, cells where they encourage their students to come in and try out new, uh, you know, new ideas or uh, take, seek support in inventing something new. So there was a student who came up with this idea of providing uh, lighting at the, uh, say, bus stands where, it's, where, it details, uh, where it details when the next bus is coming. So these are battery operated. Now that can create a problem. So what he's done is he's, he's created a, a battery cell to be put in the, in the pavement where the, the, the passengers are standing. And with the movement from the passengers, the uh, the batteries are igniting the uh, power into the into the into the into the messages. So there are so many ideas that you know young on, young entrepreneurs, brilliant engineers can come up with, and you think they're the most simple ideas. where well, you have an opportunity by going to a UK university and working on these ideas. Well, um, do we have any more questions? Let's look at the questions. Um, what is the website for visa application? Um, what is the exact website called? I think if you just type in visa application, or that I can't remember the exact uh, ID. Okay, sorry, it's gov.ac.uk. Is it? Okay. Now, I've got a question here. What are the application deadlines? For uh, undergraduates, uh, the medical deadlines are generally by the 15th of October, and these are also for universities like Oxford, Cambridge, um, LSE, and UCL. Uh, and the other, uh, other, uh, there are other deadlines as well, which is 15th of January, and that's for KCL and L LSE. Um, I, I just need to check that again. Is UCL 15th of October or 15th of Jan? Okay, I'm sorry, that's 15th of January. Um, and the, for, for the PG programs, the deadlines vary, but of course, um, 
I would encourage every student to apply as soon as possible because remember you're competing not just with other Indian students but with, uh, with, with students internationally. Remember that UK is a very, very popular destination from students across the world. We have another question here saying, is accommodation guaranteed? Yes, uh, indeed, international students are guaranteed accommodation, provided you apply within the deadline, and that's very important. Deadlines are very, very important for everything that you, that you do. Um, so we have some more questions here. How many uh, hours uh, can a student work? Well, a student can work 20 hours a week and uh, full-time during the holidays, but, and this is for both undergraduates and postgraduates. But if your course is at a, a lower level, uh, then you can only work 10 hours a week. And as I mentioned earlier, your spouse can work for the uh, for the bachelor's degrees and the PG degrees and so on, um, full time. Um, however, there is a word of warning here, and that is that, really speaking, your first, your focus is to uh, have a good degree and degree with strong marks. Because if you're looking for jobs, you will need to see good. You will need to see. To, you will need to make sure that you have good marks. That's what your employers want to see. Um, so I would not, and I would not encourage people to start trying to work the moment they get there. Um, and I mean, I went through a, a postgraduate degree myself, and I know that uh, when I was doing my uh, MBA, and I mean, we were working anything from 12 to 14 hours a day. Um, some of you may have to work less because you may be so much brighter, but it's very, very intense. And uh, for a one-year program, it's really not uh, very sensible to, to do that. If, okay, I have another question here. If I apply by December end, is it late? Um, I don't know what degree you're talking about, um, but no, if it's for an undergraduate degree, no, it's not. If it's for a postgraduate degree, no, it's not. It just depends on the, with the exceptions that we're talking about. Okay, um, we have another question here. How do psychology and economics fare in the uh, in today's career options? Well, psychology and economics are both very broad-based programs and can lead to uh, a wide variety of careers. So, as a psychologist, you can be a psychologist in whether it's uh, whether it's working with uh, in counselling. Uh, and it also leads to a lot of uh, careers in, in, for example, management, in human resources. Um, because we all need, in, 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 in management, everybody needs people who have a good understanding of other people. And economics, well, if you're good at maths and uh, have an intense uh, liking for business and want to understand the world of economics, economics is a very, very strong subject and again can lead to a wide variety of careers, whether it's in banking, whether it's in accounting, whether it's in consulting, finance, a um, lot of career options. Um, I don't have work experience, but I want to apply for uh, my MBA in, uh, uh, in some universities. Sorry, who, who wrote that question? I've just lost it. Pratik. Pratik, uh, there are a number of universities uh, that, that offer the MBA without work experience. And I think to, to enable us to guide you well, the best thing is for you to either send your documents to us or for you to come in because we do need to look at your profile and you know they, they all vary. Well, I'd also like to tell you that for the UK, we have our in-house fairs going on. And uh, I will just give you the dates so that all of you can attend. And I'm hoping that after having listened to the session, you will be interested in UK as, uh, as, the UK as a destination to go and study. So 14th of November, we have Delhi. 18th, we have Mumbai. 20th, we have Kolkata. And 22nd, we have this in Lucknow. Universities will be coming to our uh, offices. So come and meet them. Come and talk to our counselors and our teams. And as I mentioned earlier, that uh, for those of you who are interested in studying uh, in, in the UK but would like to do your first year here, you have an option to do that as well in our uh, center in Delhi and uh, some other centers. So 
call us and talk to us about it. Thank you very much everybody for listening and for your patience and uh, until the next time I now will hand this over to Ms. Rian Thomas. Thank you for joining today's webinar. We hope that you found it useful. Thanks particularly to those who contributed with their questions. This helped make the webinar more interactive and is also a very important part of the learning process. We're conscious that some of you may not have received answers to your questions this afternoon. Please rest assured that you will get a response by email. Today's event is part of the Chopra's 2014 series of webinars. Several more interesting webinars will be taking place over the coming months on a variety of topics by experts in their respective fields. And we would encourage you all again to join in and listen. All of our webinars will be advertised on our website, www.thejobras.com. Please keep checking for further details. Thanks to you all once again, and we look forward to connecting with you soon.